All right, folks, we are back again. Live. Uh, live with, Depending well, you listen to it. if you're listening now, then it's live, but if you're listening to the recording, then it isn't. Uh, we are back with uh, another webinar. Uh, if you guys missed our last one and are a parent, I would suggest you go and check it out. We had fun with it. It was a good one. Had a lot of people in there listening, had some yeah. good feedback back and forth. I had uh, fun it was with that. just about an hour long. And today's much different. If you guys have any questions, you can post some questions and uh, the chat window is open. So we'd love to have you on there. Uh, just say hello, do a little sound check, let us know that you can hear us okay. And let's get started. Let's do it. So what are we talking about today, Mr. Lonnie Beck? The eight fast to learn, but often misunderstood ways to reduce discomfort, pain, injury, so you get the most out of your workouts and attain your health and fitness goals. So we're going to be talking about eight essential tips for pain-free exercise. And if there's anybody that knows about painful exercise, it's, uh, it's us. Well, yeah, like part of um, our journey over the last however many years has been dealing with injuries surgeries and you and i used to actually rotate injuries so i would injure something i would get better then you would injure something and after about the fourth or fifth time we noticed this cycle so i knew when you were going to get injured i knew that i was next and i was like oh crap here we go right yeah so or the other way around is like all right i got six weeks of psalms recovery <laughs> yeah, so i'm safe so i'm safe i can do whatever i want so per usual, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, the most valuable thing that you can trade is your time. And we really appreciate that uh, you guys are investing your time into learn these things. Uh, very quickly, a little bit about us. So the last webinar we did, uh, we made two slides, one for Lonnie, one for me. And they were exactly the same. So uh, we just combine it into one slide. Uh, most of you probably know, some of you are new to us. Uh, we are the co-owners of the Dragon Gyms. Uh, between the two of us, we have, I said over half a century. You know how many years it is between the two of us? No. 60 years. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's it's strange to say that. Holy smokes. Um, so, you know, over that, that time of us sort of teaching and, and then doing this professionally, we've probably, we've, we sat down and figured it out one Easy. day. Yep. But thousands uh, of students and clients. And... Uh, today, we like to focus on training the trainers. Yep. And, you know, we have all these certificates too, which are. Oh, those fun pieces of paper. Yeah. Uh, so, a quick plug before we get into the meat and potatoes of what we're doing. Uh, this Friday, again, if you're listening live, this Friday, November 30th at 6 30 p.m., what are we doing? We're going to have a free self defense clinic. Now, this is going to be for men and women, um, it's going to be an hour long sort of a sample platter of what we're going to do to prop up our self-defense class that we're adding to the adult schedule in January, which we're really excited about. So we're going to be covering a whole bunch of different things in terms of awareness, some physical skills, and then open it up at the end for some Q&A as well. So that'll be this Friday at uh, 630 at the Dragon Gym. We're going to have a good time in Exit. It looks like uh, one of our students, Slater, is on. Oh, uh, so, so Hey, comment in the chat window. Love to hear from you. Good to see you here, Slater. Okay, so we're talking about the eight things, eight essential tips. Number one is the warm up, and we're probably going to spend the most time uh, on on this tip number one because it probably is the most important thing. Uh, and I like to start it off talking about warm up with these two quotes from two fairly famous health and fitness experts, so to speak. One is from a Russian guy, do you okay. know who it is? Pavel. Pavel. He always said to us, if you need to warm up, your lunch. You're dead. And then another guy, uh, Mark Ripito, okay. of Starting Strength fame, said, if you don't have time to warm up, you don't have time to work out. Yes, and they both are extremely true. Right. So, you know, we've, back in the days, our warm up was working set number one, mm -hmm. and you just got into it. 
And we realized that a lot of our injuries stemmed from that philosophy. But when it comes to like your physical preparedness, um, you need to have a baseline go faster than everybody else's. That's right. So, you know, the, the whole warm up your lunch thing is at any point, if you need to pull the trigger, whether it's in self-defense or lifting something, you need to be able to do it on a moment's notice. Right. But now as we're a little bit older, the second one is becoming more true for us as, as well. Listen, don't start a workout unless you have time to warm up. Right. Period. So some misconceptions about warming up. And, uh, you know, this is a pet peeve of mine mm -hmm. is uh, people. All right. First, now everybody's going to say, oh, Sam said stretching is bad. No, stretching is good. But you just have to understand when and how to use stretching to your benefit. And for that matter, there are many different kinds of stretching. Yeah, you right? got uh, static stretching and PNF stretching and all kinds of other things down the line. So a misconception we see a lot in our gym and you know in other gyms all the time is people conflate this idea of warming up with stretching because they think of two things when they stretch. They think stretching is going to prevent injury. Yep. And stretching will reduce pain or DOMS. Mm, delayed onset muscle soreness. And I think what that goes down to is uh, folks don't know what to do, so they just stretch. Yeah, they hop into the gym, and the first stretch that they always do is the one across the arm across the, uh, the shoulder or the arm across the chest. Yeah, and typically stretching uh, ends up being this, exactly like you said, passive stretching. Right. You know, you hold a pose You're not and, doing anything. and touch your toes uh, or, you know, stretch your tricep. You know, the, the joke we have is like, you know, both of us live in neighborhoods and then, you know, people go jog in the neighborhood, right? Yeah. And they stretch their tricep. They do that elbow behind the head thing, yeah, stretch you your stretch tricep your for? for like 30 seconds <laughs> and then go jogging. <laughs> like I'm ready to go. It makes no sense. Um, anyway. Uh, here, here are some warnings about passive stretching. So again, a passive stretch is sort of when you, you know, the typical example is you touch your toes and hold it for, you know, anything longer than 15 seconds, that like 15 to 60 second stretch. What that actually does is weaken your muscles mm -hmm. and increases the pain tolerance of your muscles. And that leads to more injury. So this is a little weird thing is like, Wait, increases the pain tolerance. Why is that a bad thing? Why is that a bad thing? Because pain is what protects you from injury. So when you start to feel that pain is when you know to get off the gas. Yeah. Right. Or don't or really what what the stretch pain is. So it's like if I reach too far, that pain tells my brain to pull back in. Correct. If I sort of take that away by stretching, then you're gonna overexert yourself. You're gonna overexert or overextend. So uh, our rule of warming up is don't do passive stretching before you exercise. And your nervous system and your body is actually going to tense that muscle when you stretch it because it doesn't want to be stretched yet. It, it doesn't have the proper mm -hmm. blood flow through it. It's not warmed up. So when you go to do that touch your toes, after just a few seconds of doing that, your body's starting to contract that muscle. So That's now right. you're fighting against yourself. So here are some pointers from us. What, I, what I'm saying is start warming up for your day, not just your workout. So rather than saying, okay, I'm working out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to hit the weights hard, and then I'm going to add a warm up. We're not even at working out yet. Just add this sort of warm up for your day. So it would be something to be done early in the mornings is my suggestion. I'll let you define what early means. And if you're Jocko, it's four. 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. He's very, um, very adamant about waking up at 4.30 in the morning or earlier. Um, like I said, I'll let you decide what early means to you. But we have uh, a couple of things here for you to do. First, I suggest doing some sort of mindfulness or meditation practice. Uh, just sort of clear your head, work on your breathing a little bit, then walk. Everybody can do it. I, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people can do it. Most people do it. You got a dog, bring the dog with you. You got a baby, put it in the stroller, whatever it is. 20 to 60 minutes of walking and then do some joint mobility. So joint mobility really is moving your joints through 
their range of motion. So like wrist circles, neck circles, shoulder circles, hip circles, knee circles, and you, you get the idea. Circling those joints all around the body, twisting your upper body, and then get into some light stretching slowly and through a full range of motion. So instead of touching your toes and holding it for 15 seconds, slowly touch your toes and stand up five to 10 times. Right. It's probably going to do more benefit than just doing the static hold. And then sort of our approach is because we have sort of a daily ritual or practice of warming up, we have that, you know, I'm ready to go if I need it yeah. at all times. So what to do before your workout, something like you have something that literally warms you up. So a brisk walking, jogging, jumping rope, jumping jacks, those types of things are actually going to make your blood, your, your heart pump faster. You know, you're going to get more oxygen in your blood because you're going to be breathing heavier. Your muscles are going to start to produce that lactic acid. And now your body is really like you've turned the car on and you let it sit in the driveway for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't get in the car and just go. You know, all the, the weird noises that your car makes when that happens it's because it's not properly warmed up. So also here's like, you know, some basic body weight stuff so like squats, lunges, push ups. And also if you're a sedentary person. This is what's really going to get that motor going as well. And it's going to kick you in the gear to be able to start to have this as your baseline to moving on to something a little bit more intricate and difficult later, right? Like kettlebell swings, all that fun stuff. So here you have the warm up is the workout. Yeah. So the, the idea here is let's say um, we're doing squats today. Okay. How do you warm up for squats? Sometimes I'll do squats. With squats, yeah. right? So. You know, we might be squatting with uh, 200 pounds or something. So your warm up is body weight squats. Yep. And then maybe some squats with just the bar, mm -hmm. some foam rolling, some yeah. walking, some range of motion stuff. Your warm up should, in some way, mimic the movements you're going to be doing in your workout. This goes back to the I'm going jogging, so I'm going to start stretching my triceps. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the other. Uh, you know, in our martial arts classes, you know, let's say we're doing kicking combinations, hitting targets, then the warm up will be doing slower, lower kicks in the air. Yep. So it's like a way of progressing into the more intense portion of the training. Mm hmm. Ah, okay. Tip number two be progressive. And this is something we see all of the time. Well, and, you know, trying too much too soon is something that I see a lot of uh, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s do because of where they once were when they were teenagers and in their 20s. Right. Like competitive athletes, they have this baseline of where they used to be, and they figure, that's where I left off, that's where I'm going to start. And that's where often injury starts to come into play. So, you know, focus on, you know, getting into it easier. Do a little bit more, you know, high intensity interval training, or you could do super high intensity interval training. Yes. Yes. I don't know if anybody put that one together. Yeah. And thinking about the short term, long term, or short term challenge. Yeah. You know, only so thinking about that. Usually people start with an exercise program, whether it's martial arts or kettlebells or barbells or fitness in general, because there's some sort of trigger. Right. right? So it's like maybe that trigger is as simple as it's New Year's yep. and you have a New Year's resolution, uh, but the trigger could be something else. It could be something more emotional. Uh, you know, maybe you saw a picture of yourself yep. and you hadn't really seen that and you said, wow, I'm really overweight. Or it could be something happened to you or to a loved one or you saw something on the news or social media and you're like, wow, I really need to learn self-defense. Yeah. So that trigger causes an emotional response and that emotional response can manifest as excitement or urgency. Which is jet fuel. Yeah. And we're like, all right, I want to do everything at once. But we have to take a step back and say, no, let's not just think about the short term. Let's think about the long term. Right. right? I can work out for two hours every day for the first week. And then, and we've seen, we see those people who are like, Hey, slow down, take it easy. And then they hurt something. They're super sore. They're frustrated. And over the long run, they can't stick with the program. Right. Cause as, as much, you know, energy that they had in that emotion to get in the gym, 
the emotion that they experience when they have that little defeat is twice as powerful mm. and that'll just render them on the couch for a very long time after yeah. that. So what to do? This sort of goes back to some of the guidelines we set forth in tip number one is only add one element at a time. So before you say, hey, I'm going to start lifting weights or hitting the heavy bag or doing jujitsu two to three days per week, make a commitment to doing some sort of walking or low intensity cardio. It might be biking, might be elliptical, maybe swimming, um, maybe even jogging if you are in better shape. Uh, that can be done every day. So there's two things here. One is that pro progressive idea is I'm going to add a little bit of activity before I add a lot of activity. And the second part of that is it's sort of uh, a test of your own discipline and compliance right. to stick with something. So you know, first, can you have the discipline? Do you have the commitment to just walk for 20 minutes a day? Because if you don't have the ability to do that, then why go anywhere else? Why, That's where why go start. further, right? Uh, what, what, do you remember that Admiral's name? I don't, uh, make your bed guy. Yeah. No. But it's, it's that idea, right? Yeah. Like you want to go change the world. Like, Hey, start with your room, start, make, make your bed, make your bed. Right. Then on top of that daily low intensity work, we're going to stack strength training or martial arts training, potentially both, but let's say one or the other. Mm -hmm. Right. So for you, what does strength training look like? Uh, well, I'm just, I, just ending a powerlifting cycle. So the strength training is one day I'll be deadlifting, another day I'll be squatting, benching. So just just for clarification, powerlifting is powerlifting is essentially the big three movements. So it's lifting as much weight as you can yeah. in a deadlift, a squat, or a bench. So you're you're deadlifting with a barbell. With a barbell. Squatting with a barbell. With a barbell. And bench pressing with a barbell. Correct. Uh, so when we talk about the big three lifts or powerlifting, we really mean barbell work barbell specific work right yeah and we'll circle back to that and then martial arts training so like for me that's two to three days a week of taekwondo practice which includes punching kicking hitting stuff and doing right. forms and and then the jujitsu that you do as well right? yeah and then third thing we want to stack on is what we call high intensity exercise all you need is one to two days per week so what are some things that would be examples of high intensity exercise? Well, I mean, that could be a number of things. It could be riding an airdyne bike and doing Tabata drills. It could be hitting the bag for, you know, a few rounds um, as fast as you can. It could be uh, jogging, swimming, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I mean, that, all that stuff super so, high intensity. So, you know, like let's use martial arts as an example. If I'm in a, in a jiu-jitsu class, the bulk of the class is probably like drilling, training, learning. And You're then, not killing yourself. And then there's a little bit of sparring at the end. Right. But once a week, maybe maybe twice a week, sometimes every other week, you'll have a day where we just do rounds. Just spar. Just spar. Like yep. four to eight minute rounds, high intensity for an hour. Yep. But you can't do that every day. No. You right? wouldn't be able to come back the next day. And that's so, the issue. You know, you do the number one, you do the low intensity stuff five to seven days per week the medium intensity stuff two to three days a week, and then the high intensity stuff one to two days a week. Got it. Right? And then the other idea of being progressive is increasing the difficulty so you keep getting improvements. Yeah. Right? So weightlifting is the easiest example. If I can bench press 135 pounds, eventually I want to start going for 140 pounds. Right. That's easier to measure because the numbers are there. Right? Yeah, it's, it's very quantifiable. But the same thing is true with uh, other forms of training. You just have to figure out what's what's the next, how do you define the next rung on the ladder right. that you have to reach for? Number three. Number three, get a real coach. And this is more important than ever because of this wonderful thing called the World Wide Web. Listen, there is, if you're not sure that you need a coach, this is something that's really interesting. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a personal trainer. Yeah. By the way, how intimidating must it be for you to be Arnold Schwarzenegger's yeah. personal <laughs> trainer? But the fact is, is that he reached the pinnacle of bodybuilding and, and strength training, and he still has somebody that tells him what to do. Yeah. So the there is a, number one, 
there there is a uh, wisdom in objectivity. Yeah. Right. So I can train myself. I have all the knowledge of the lifts and the movements and the martial arts. But there's just something, you know, like we were bench pressing today. Yeah. Right. I'm not a bench press. It's pretty. It's simple. Yeah. It's a simple movement. I've been doing it apparently wrong for, for the last long, twenty years. Long time. <laughs> right. So a coach, somebody watching your movements can say, hey, here's a little tweak to your form. And they can say, hey, here's how you take your form and do some reps and sets with that. How did that feel for you today? Much better. Yeah. Much better. So, uh, you know, we have this thing called information overload on, on the Internet, right? There's so much information out there. Much of it is conflicting. And it's hard to know if it's a good information or not. Right. And here's the worst thing. It may even be good information, but it may not work with other information. So some information, A is good, information B is good, but they're not complementary. They're contradictory. Right. So for example, uh, a high protein diet could be very effective. Sure. Right? Uh, ketogenic, a high fat diet could be very good. But can I do both? Nope. They don't work together. Right? Uh, and all of this makes it hard to stay the course and trust the process. And fundamentally, that's what really works, is trusting the process and going through the steps as defined. So what do you do? Find a coach. Online, group classes, personal training. Yeah. Um, you know, I work with a coach now personally. And like you said, I've been we've been lifting weights. Remember the first time I started lifting weights was in 2000. That was 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I bought a book. It's called um, oh, Body of Life. Oh, yeah. By uh, Bill. What was that guy's name? I, I can't remember his name. I remember the book. So. Um, but even then, I knew that, you know, listen, I can go into the gym and I can just start putting weight up, but I don't know what's going on. Um, I haven't had as much success with my own lifting as I have now since I have a coach. Somebody that just shows up and says, do A through Z, and he sits there and watches me, and, he, and I get it done. And it's one, that's one less thing that I have to think about. And two, it adds a little bit of motivation and accountability to the whole process. So right, finding exactly. Finding that coach is, is there's there's feedback. It's two way yeah. communication, right. right? So when you get uh, a book, you read the book, and it it could be a incredibly informative book. Bill Phillips. Bill Phillips. Yeah, it's an incredible, incredibly informative book. But if you have a question. Or if you're doing something that might be a little bit wrong, you don't know it. You don't know. That coach is there to give you that feedback. I have a good coach. Anybody's interested. He's a really good coach. So what do you do after you find a coach? How do you know that they're a good coach? Uh, well, this is a really interesting concept because, you know, there's – when we talk about, uh, you know, coaching is, you know, how do you measure how good a coach is? One, it's – it can be measured by their experience, mm -hmm. their level of success that they have in that particular field. But what might be even more important is the levels that their students or clients have reached. Correct. Like where are they taking the people that are under their auspice? You know, if you find a coach and, you know, this, it's a, a Hollywood trainer and he's, a, you know, $1,000 an hour. But for some reason, you look behind the curtain and all of his students that have been with him for three or four years are out of shape. They have injuries. You know, they're getting rabbed or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, that the proof is not in that pudding. So you have to find out, you know, testimonials, man. Testimonials. Right? You know, what what are what are other people saying about that coach? Right. right? Is are are you getting good feedback from others? And have they produced and the, the, there's a couple key uh points here, right? Have they produced the results you are looking for in themselves or others? Right. right? So for example, uh, in a powerlifting program, right? What are you looking for to get out of the powerlifting? Me specifically? Yeah, you specifically. Um, one, I'm looking for um, reduced body fat, increased strength, and overall uh, better health of my joints. Right. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for bigger numbers. Bigger numbers. Yeah. Deal. Right. But you know that with the coach that I have, that his clients are producing yeah. huge numbers. So, you know, it just so happens that, you know, we, we have the same coach and he has been able to produce results in both of those areas. Right. right? So it's, but it's, that's okay if he wasn't right. So like, let's say I go to a kettlebell coach and that kettlebell coach is really good at producing fat loss results. Yes. Right. 
He's a good coach. Correct. But I'm not looking for fat loss. No. I'm looking for numbers. Right. I- increasing my strength numbers. So he's a good coach, but not the right coach for me. Yeah. Right. So just because someone's not the right coach for you doesn't mean they're a good coach and vice versa. And then the other is this first bullet point, how much relevant experience do you have? So I think a lot of times, and we sort of open this way, uh, cause I planned on circling back to it is this mm-hmm. idea of quantity of experience. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you and I, like we said, we have 60 years of combined experience. Yeah. But right? if we've been doing the wrong thing for 60 years, exactly. So, on. You know, the the way I put it is, does somebody have 30 years of experience or do they have one year of experience 30 times? Are they, yeah, there you go. Right. So you want to see how relevant their experience is. Are they learning new strategies? Are they evolving their techniques with new information? Right. right. So like the technology and information we have today about martial arts is so different than what we had 30 years ago. There's a, a huge controversy going on right now in the martial arts industry with a very, very well-respected jiu-jitsu guy. I won't say his name. That is saying that jiu-jitsu was better in the 80s than it is today. And I firmly believe that it's like saying that their Apple computers in 1988 were better and more efficient than they are in 2018. It's just not a true statement. Things right. have evolved so much that you can't go off the information that you learned 30 years ago and just repeat it. You know, there there has to be a constant growth and there has to be just, man, the amount of information that's out there and at our fingertips changes every day. What should they do? Use their knowledge to develop a plan of action. That's listen, they, they need to give you a roadmap. You know, they need to give you an idea of what this painting is going to look like, right? So it's not just blindly follow me. It's, there should be a bit of an interview process, and, and you should tell them all the things that you want, and then they should have a, a, a plan of action to you. They're going to teach you how exactly you're going to implement it, and then they're going to provide you accountability and support for that, right? So the accountability and support from my coach is, hey, uh, you said that you were going to be here Monday at noon. I'll see you Monday at noon. That's right. And if I don't see him Monday at noon, I know that I'm going to hear it. Right. So, you know, that, that push from behind. And and part of that consistency is what helps us avoid injury. Correct. So a lot of times people, they're doing all the right things, except they're not consistent. Right. So I'm supposed to be deadlifting every Thursday, Mm -hmm. but I miss a Thursday here and I miss a Wednesday there. Right. And then you're like, all right, I'm going to go hit it hard because I missed a couple of days. And that's when you get hurt. That's when you're going to get hurt. So that that sort of accountability to the program and following the plan as written helps prevent injury. Well, what it also does is, and I actually just got a plan today because I failed the big lift that I've been working for. And I got discouraged, but then I got re-encouraged when our coach said, here's what we're doing for the next four weeks. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pull you back. We have steps one through four, which is weeks one through four. And at the end of that fourth week, I guarantee you that that weight that was on the ground that you weren't able to pull is going to come up. Yeah. So it gave me a lot of encouragement to say, hey, look, it's not where I wanted to be right now, but I see exactly where I'm going. Yeah. What did he say this morning? Just because you're struggling doesn't mean you're failing. Yep. I thought that was really good. That was a good one. Number four, strength and stability. So why should you strength train? I think uh, it's fairly well accepted that strength training protects your joints. Mm-hmm. You know, strengthening the muscles around your your joints protects them, uh, both the large and small muscles. Uh, it also puts mechanical stress on the bones, yep. and that's a good thing. That it is. increases the bone density. Uh, most people find it physically and mentally rewarding to strength train and Makes when you're stronger easier. life is easier yeah you got to go move that uh snow blower out next week when it when we get 15 inches of snow i don't think we are i don't want people to freak out yeah. about that but somebody's gonna easier. be listening to this in july yeah. and listen we're talking about protecting the joints and things like that like I, i've had a total reconstruction on my right knee and uh, my, my knee is stronger than ever. I have far less pain because the ligaments and the tendons around it are keeping everything in where, it, where it needs to be. So the adage of uh, ah, bad knee, bad this, bad that, you got to strength train. What to do? 
strength movements so start with full body movements first so the you know the four are a push pull a hinge a squat you know push could be push-ups a press a bench press pulls or you know anything from bent over rows to lifting a barbell off the ground or doing um you know some type of pull with a, a sled um squats are very easy to do um you know if you have limited range of motion you can do half squats you can do bottoms up squats mm -hmm. start to protect the knee armor the back squats are also really really underrated for developing your core strength especially if you're front loaded that's right so developing the abs developing you know the the whole anterior chain of, of uh of muscles and then also hinge stuff so that's where your kettlebell swings come into play and and uh, and a number of other exercises as well. deadlifting bridging deadlifting, lunges bridging. Yep. uh hinge movements so why why stability training? Well, these are some bunch of big words right here, huh? Integration of aforementioned movements. <laughs> <laughs> you tell who wrote this slide. Yeah. So you know this idea is like, what is stability, and where does it sort of fall into the the realm of when we're talking about strength training, right? So strength training, we have movement in a couple planes, right? We've got pushing, and we've got pulling, and we've got squatting, and we've got hinging. So these are sort of like opposite sides of the coin you know so if like squatting and hinging is like your half dollar coin okay. right and pushing and pulling is like your quarter yep you know and heads and tails but the stability is sort of like well sometimes i need to be pushing and pulling sometimes you do right and sometimes i need to be squatting and pulling and hinging and pushing so it's the stability think of it more of like life isn't in a straight line there's diagonals and circles yep and that's why stability is important right it also helps with when you need to start a movement and you need to change direction changing directions is a big thing you know so yeah. that's the, the ankles and the knees can tolerate mm -hmm. that going from moving forward to moving sideways uh stability is what helps you create force right so that goes to starting a movement but think more in this like explosive way if i developed my stability i can jump or i can kick yeah throw a punch whatever it might be but here's the big one it helps reduce force so after you jump what do you have to do land land you have to n teach your body how to reduce or absorb yeah. impact jump and you see people jump and land doing these box jumps it looks like they're feeling an earthquake through their body yeah you know and stability training will protect what we call the prime movers from uh, when your prime movers fatigue. So typically, let's uh, let's go to the squat example, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm squatting, either doing a lot of reps or a lot of weight, what fatigues your quads? Quads, right? So when your quads fail, if I've done some work for those smaller muscles, right? So instead of just squatting all the time, we do like um, wall sits yep. or Roman chairs. That strengthens those uh, smaller stabilizer muscles. So when the big ones fatigue, I'm still going to be uh, somewhat protected. So what should you do? So what we call awkward moves and positions, planks, bird dogs, bridges, dead bugs, and uh, training on unstable surfaces as far as safe. Bird dogs are a deceivingly difficult exercise. To yeah. Do. So for those of you guys that don't know what a bird dog is, is you're essentially on all fours and you lift same side opposite side uh it can be done either Both, way right? so, so you would technical terms are contralateral and ipsilateral okay so all fours so your knees right knee left knee right hand left hand are on the floor right, right? so a typical bird dog is i will lift up my right hand and my left knee right hand would be lifted up extended in front of you like you're waving high to somebody right and then and your left knee comes off the ground and your left heel is doing like a donkey kick behind yes, you. Right. right. So that's what we would call contralateral. Mm -hmm. If you're really good, you could do it with what's called ipsilateral. So that means my left hand and left knee stay on the ground. Yes. Right hand and right leg extend. That's so remember we used to have to do that in the FMS test? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we still have to do it in the FMS. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change. Uh, bridges. So bridges can be shoulder bridges, head bridges, or uh, back bridges, which would be fully on your hands. So you lay on your back, feet are flat, knees are bent. Yep. 
So a shoulder bridge is I'm just pushing my hips towards the sky, towards the ceiling. My shoulders stay on the ground, mm -hmm. right? A neck bridge could be done forward or backward. Let's say we, we stay on our backs. So feet are on the floor, push up to the shoulders, roll up to your head. So yeah. now your head and, and your feet are on the ground. So your neck is taking a lot of the pressure here. Uh, typically, I would not recommend it unless you're a wrestler, yeah. right? And then the more like yoga esque or gymnastic esque is your hands are on the floor, your feet are on the floor, and you're going to push through the floor on your hands and your feet. So now your hips, your push back, your belly button up towards the and ceiling. your belly button is up towards the ceiling. Dead bugs again. You're on your back, feet are in the air, hands are in the air like a dead bug. Yep. Right. And then unstable surfaces. So if you always train on a perfectly flat, hard floor, you don't really get to train uh, the sort of like reactive muscles in your feet and uneven ankles. type of stuff. Right. right. So that's one of the nice things about training on mats a lot because the mats have a little bit of flex. Mm -hmm. So just uh, reflexively, your feet are sort of making these micro adjustments right. all of the time. Training on sand could do that. Training in bare feet generally can help with that. Um, you know, if you're a little farther along, uh, you know, running on grass instead of a track, doing trail running, uphill, downhill. Um, and then people get sort of carried away with it where they're doing stuff on these, like, uh, balls and, like, trying you can, to, yeah. you know, that you don't have to go crazy with it, but there's some advantage to that. All right, tip number five. Recover, man. Plan it. Plan recovery. Otherwise, it will be planned for you. In the form of injury. Your ass is on the couch for four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't and shouldn't be 100% all of the time, right? So the recovery day should be built in. And that's something, again, if you have a good coach, that's something mm -hmm. that they're going to plan for you. So you know, the stress is stress, even if it's from exercise, you know, if you're a little bit sore, people are trying to work through the pain, you know, your body needs that, that time to reproduce the hormones that it's using to heal the muscles and, you know, damage, you know, finish the, uh, the, all of the things that it needs to do to get you back to where you, where you were started. Working through that can definitely be a contra, uh, you know, contradicting thing. So listening to your body, creeping aches and pains, I've noticed now that the more mobility work that I do, the less cracks I have as I'm going yeah. down the steps, yeah. which a year ago was huge. I think I used, I woke my wife up one time getting out of bed because my knees and my ankles popped mm -hmm. that loud. Mm -hmm. Disruption in sleep. What do you mean? So most people have a fairly regular sleep pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't, that is also probably a sign that there's too much stress, right. you know, mental or physical. So disruption in sleep is, uh, you know, if you're overtraining, you might not be able to fall asleep yeah. as easily as normal. Or you're you're not able to wake up as easily as normal. Um, Those or, are the days that you wake up and you feel like you've been you haven't slept. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or in more severe cases, is you're waking up in the middle of the night because you're in pain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, weakened immune system. Does it seem like you're getting sick or you just have that cold you can't shake? Yep. That is a warning sign. Um, if you don't plan recovery, you will increase the likelihood of a bigger injury, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and this is all too familiar, is that wear and tear will catch up with you. Always does. You know, so, uh, you know, training is like a buying a used car. It's not about the years. It's about the mileage. It's all about the mileage. Right? So what do you do? So scheduling at least one or two rest days per week. For me, I've always made this a Saturday and Sunday just because it's convenient. Um, but depending on what you're doing, that might change. Um, you don't have to be totally idle. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's good to sort of keep it going, keep that arousal level a little bit more than a sedentary uh, person is, you know, but reduce just below like 40%. So on your rest day, you know, don't be that weekend warrior or like rest day and just did a hundred reps of something. Well, that's not your rest day. Anymore, yeah, exactly. Right? And then it's also tracking, you know, tracking your diet, your sleep, your grip strength. huh? So diet is easy to keep track of. Write down everything you eat. Sleep, our phones do it now. 
And if yeah. you wear yourself an Apple Watch, if you wear it to bed, which I don't, I find it uncomfortable, um, you can actually tra track your sleep patterns as well. You have to wear it to bed, though. You have to wear it to bed, or you can put the iPhone um, under your mattress. No way. No? no. You're not doing that? No. The Russians? <laughs> yeah. Um, but your, your iPhone will actually tr track how much you move and then how many hours of deep sleep that you've hey, gotten and look, stuff like just that. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean no one's following. <laughs> Why track your grip strength? Okay, so a, a couple of things here. So, you know, tracking your diet, I would say is, you know, tracking what's going in, but also like how you feel about eating, which is a little more subjective, but in a sense, you know, have you, you eat a specified amount of food, right? And have you ever finished that meal and been like, man, I'm still hungry? Yeah, like the last two weeks. Yeah. So I think okay. that is something worth tracking. Is not it's like everybody talks about food tracking and it's like, all right, I had my two chicken breasts and my uh four cups of broccoli. Yeah. But did you have that and did you feel full or were you hungry? Did you need right. more? Right. So I think there's some value into that. Or my appetite is diminished. Yeah. Like, oh man, I just don't have an appetite. So all of these things could be signs of overtraining. Mm -hmm. Or if you are training a lot, like you have just huge amounts of volume of training, you need to increase your diet. And there's certain right. times that you do need to listen to your, your yeah. biology. Um, then this idea of grip strength is, it is just a way to sort of test uh, fatigue in your body. Okay. So if you, you might do lifts, and some days you feel like, oh, wow, my grip is really strong. And then the same lift, same poundage, it feels like your grip just yeah. isn't there. So that can be a sign of what we call uh, central nervous system fatigue, mm -hmm. right? So that, again, is a sign of overtraining. Yeah. That if your grip is starting to go, that's like the canary in the coal mine. Okay, this is, this is a good sign. That's why I was never a fan of using, like, straps or anything mm -hmm. because it's, a, it's like self-limiting. It's an artificial grip. Yeah. All right. And then, of course, learn the difference between the pain of effort and the pain of injury. Right. right? So there's this old saying, no pain, no gain, mm. uh, which may be true, but it's it's that idea. It's, it's the pain of effort, not the pain of injury. Like well, don't 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 try to power through something that's hurting you. There's a documentary now on the greatest bodybuilder of all time. I guess that's a subjective statement. Ron Coleman. Sure. And uh, he can no longer walk. And uh, it was because he would constantly push through those pains that were actually injuries. Right. He had to. He had to, you know, that this is what he wanted to do. But, you know, us, you know, normal folk, you know, you have to list, listen to that. You feel that searing pain. You feel that flame in your back. So no, that's, a, that's a sign to stop. Yeah. So you have to be consistent. You have to follow the plan. But part of that plan needs to include some sort of variety. Mm -hmm. right so why is variety important i think one is just this like wear and tear of repetitive motions right uh two uh let's skip two and come back to it and then three is this said principle so what that is is an acronym for spe specific adaptation to impose demands so if I do the same thing over and over and over again, I get really good at doing that thing. Correct. But not necessarily anything else. And so the 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 returns, you know, gains from that activity start to diminish. Right. right? So when I first start out and um, you know, I've never bench pressed before, let's say, for example. And I do it, and then every week I'm, a, I'm able to add 20 pounds to my bench, 20 pounds to my bench. But eventually you reach a point where you can't add 20 pounds a week it diminishes to maybe 10 pounds a week right and then five pounds a week and then you find yourself stuck at you know whatever your max rep max weight or max reps are for a long time mm -hmm. so that's what we call diminishing returns but if you sort of move away from the bench press and work on dumbbell pressing and overhead pressing you can sort of get those gains somewhere else. Right. And then you come back to bench pressing and then you'll start to see the strength. It's exactly the cycle I started today. Interesting. Well, we'll start tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but so it's like conceptually, you know, uh, look at martial arts. We've done that a lot. And this also goes to the boredom, lack of motivation piece mm -hmm. of it, right? If I do the same thing over and over and over and over yeah, again. You get so bored of it. Yeah. And then you lack motivation and then you stop sticking with your workouts or you're, you're not as 
um, focused during the workouts. So like with martial arts, you know, you and I did Taekwondo for years and years and years and years and get right. maybe got a little stale. So we branched out into jujitsu right. or Thai boxing. And not only did we learn something new, it sort of freshened our yep. approach to our, our original traditional training. So what do you do? What do you do to mix it up? Um, well, I like to, uh, especially now, like I'm, I'm going, going to be moving away from the barbell if we're talking about specifically strength training, mm -hmm. is I'm moving away from the barbell and I'm going to be incorporating some what are called supersets of dumbbell work, some kettlebell work, some body weight stuff, some sprints. Nice. So it really is, it's going to give me a lot of different elements. It's going to hit my nervous system differently. And it's just going to sort of reinvigorate me as, you know, when it comes to talking about my exercise. Um, I love hitting pads. I love hitting the bag with, um, you know, tie boxing. And then uh, I haven't been able to do jujitsu just because of a, a nose injury that I'm getting over mm. and, or a mm. fix of a nose injury right. that I'm getting over. But right. Um, I'm excited to hop back in there to start to do that as well. Um, so, you know, I, I get bored easily of things. You know, I'll, I'll get stuck in a rut and I'll just get sort of pulled down and then I lose my motivation. But if I'm constantly switching things up within that plan of what I'm doing, working towards, it helps me so much better. So, you know, here are some examples. Uh, you know, let's say you're always doing kettlebells, some sort of kettlebell workout. Uh, you know, switch it up with some body weight training, yeah. some barbell training, or, you know, you're more interested in cardio development and you're always running. Well, hit the cycle or hit the pool. Uh, you're doing one martial art, try another martial art or complement your martial art with something like yoga yeah. or, or conditioning or strength training. And you can look at this on a micro or macro level. So on a macro level, think of more long term. So I'm going to do a three month uh, program with jujitsu mm -hmm. and then i'm going to do a three-month program with taekwondo and then i'm going to do a three-month program with jujitsu so it's like on a longer more macro level is one way to look at it or you can look at it at a micro level maybe it's like on a weekly basis mm -hmm. right so i'm a i'm a kettlebell person right so four days a week i'm doing kettlebells but on that fifth day i'm just doing body weight yeah so there there's like two scales or scopes where you can plan this variety in. So like your example is, hey, I was doing this power lifting phase. It was probably 12 weeks long. 12 weeks. 12 weeks. Yeah. And so now the next 12 weeks we're doing something else. It's going to be right? a little bit more bodybuilding specific stuff. But it's also all of this comes down to open-mindedness. Right. And I think that especially for people that are in kettlebells or in CrossFit or in powerlifting, it becomes very dogmatic. And it almost becomes like an abandoning abandonment of themselves and their values if they go out to try something different. Yeah. But that's when you're going to experience real growth. You know, you go out and you can leave kettlebells and start to pick up a barbell or vice versa. Man, you're, you'll see huge gains in, in everything. Yeah, this is especially true with martial arts. It's huge. So here's a uh, just sort of uh, another way of looking at this. So I have two columns here. You know, column on the right, column on the left, they're both exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of a way for you to map this in your minds is let's say on the column on the left, you do one of those things. So plan your variety, just draw a line, you know, in some diagonal fashion to something on the other column. There you go. Right. And then again, think about it in this micro macro way. Right. So on a micro level, let's say on the weekly basis. I'm a uh, Muay Thai kickboxing practitioner. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that two to three times per week. And I'm going to add in yoga one time per week. How can that hurt you? I guess it depends on the yoga. <laughs> yeah, <it's> true. <laughs> but, or look at it at a macro level, right? I am uh, spending, you know, like a really long term macro level, right? I spent 15 years doing Taekwondo. I'm going to spend the next six months. Focusing on my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There you go. Right. Tip number seven: elimination. Eliminate those bad habits and positions. So think about patterns and behaviors outside of the gym that could be detrimental. So we've sort of up to now spent a lot of time thinking about the the workout itself. Yeah. Right. 
So you're working out an hour a day. Mm -hmm. What about the other 23 hours? What are you doing? Right? You know, are you sleeping? Do you use too many pillows when you sleep? Could you have a better mattress? Are you spending a lot of time watching TV? Uh, I made up a word here. I'm I I was gonna want I was wondering if this is actually like a thing now. It might be. Yeah, you're phoning. You're phoning. Uh, because you're not talking on the phone. No one talks on the you're phone. You're sort of anymore. hunched over and looking at this device in your wrist. Yep. Um you ever look at your phone so long you look up and forget like you you were in like some vortex and you're like it yeah. takes you out of this the yeah. actual space and time you're in. Um and the, you know, these these devices and the the applications on these devices are specifically designed to do that. They work. But you know, all of these things might be affecting uh, you know, your your posture and, and how your muscles are learning to rest. Right. You know, do you spend a lot of time sitting uh, or driving when you sit at your desk, you know, what's your posture like? Yeah. You know, when you're driving, are you like hunched over? Are you leaning to the left, leaning to the right? Um, how long do you sit at one time? There's a, I heard a, a, a really cool um, theory on this was, or idea is to set an alarm on your clock every hour mm -hmm. and then it will go off and it's, it's an opportunity for you to check everything between from your posture to your attitude to your actions. Yeah. So that, uh, that alarm goes off at the top of the hour whenever you set it and you say, what have I been thinking about the last hour? How am I standing? And what's my attitude been in that hour? And that's an opportunity for you to start to change it. And eventually you'll learn that behavior on your own. So, so when you're, I like your method much better. It's much more sophisticated. Yeah. But when I used to work in an office, my rule was I had to drink a glass of water. So like eight or 10 ounce glass of water every hour. Every hour. Right. So one, you're getting a lot of water in, but there's a, a inherent need to get up from your desk every so often. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sorry, boss. you know, that's, there's just some mechanisms that you can build in uh, to make sure that you're getting up and standing up and moving around periodically if you can. Uh, you know, is there any repetitive job function that could be modified? Mm -hmm. You know, so right now we're sort of talking about sitting and posture, but typing itself can, can be pretty brutal in the hands and wrists. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something in your job that you do that is very repetitive and asymmetrical. I don't yeah, know. It depends what you do for work. But yeah, you're contracting, you're carrying spackle buckets all the time on yeah. your right side. You're going to start to develop a, you know, some yeah. some tendencies with that. So, um, are you following? So this isn't really elimination necessarily, but uh, are you following all the safety protocols in your work or in your daily life? So. Uh, you might not get injured at the gym, no. but if you get hurt doing something stupid, for lack of a better word, well, then you're not going to be able to get to the gym because right. you're hurt, right? Then, then so, you start that spiral. Then And you start that spiral. And so, this last one is the... Uh, and this is big. Eliminate this one is the crown. negative people and influences, uh, both because you know they'll be dragging you down in some way, some unhealthy thing, mm -hmm. but also... Uh, you know, if, if that stuff is on your mind, then you it's difficult to focus right. when you're in the gym. Yeah. And that focus is so important of what you're doing right here, right now, to make sure that you're safe and getting getting the most effectiveness out of your work. Somebody told me this a while ago, one of my students, um, she said that when she's in the gym for that hour, she forgets all of the negative people that are in her life. Um, many of them being coworkers and that she socializes with. And she said that after a few weeks, she realized that that hour was so good without them that she decided to remove them from not only her uh, social life, but also her mind. Yeah. And, yeah. and from there she was healthier, you know, right. she felt better. So it, it, when you're in that hour, that's a really great time to just escape. Listen, all your problems are going to be there when you come back. But it's a good opportunity for you to give your, your mind a rest. So when when you walk into the, the dragon gyms, there's a sort of like ritual or etiquette that we do, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what program you're in, is sort of you you stand at the threshold to the to the training floor and you like bow in or salute, right? And it's not just about uh, etiquette 
or you know bowing to the flags or paying respect to your country. We got a little reminder on this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right? But what that is is there's that moment that of change. So it's like when I'm at work, I'm at home, I'm driving, whatever you may be doing, there is there's certain things you just have to deal with. Mm-hmm. You can't necessarily eliminate them. But at least for the next hour or hour and a half that you're about to train. You can leave them at the door. You you literally leave them at the door. Mm-hmm. And that's what that sort of like little bit of etiquette, little bit of ritual is all about. Is that change, that inflection, right? I'm stepping onto the training floor. This is who I am. This is what I'm here for. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, yesterday, you hung that sign yeah. on top of the, uh, right on top of that threshold is this idea of, be the coffee, mm-hmm. right? So part of it is, you know, we're there to improve ourselves, but the idea of the be the coffee is through through improving ourselves, we can also help others right. and then help the community and help the society uh, ultimately. The last one. Number eight, eat right. right. I know you're big on this. Well, this is such a, a huge component in everybody's either success or failure. And I think that everything that we do comes down to emotion and how you feel about something. And when the diet's not right and you're eating things, people have, have more self guilt than they're, than they care to express. And a lot of that comes down to the way that they eat. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole concept of 80% diet, 20% exercise is very true that of the results you're going to get, the majority of the results that you're going to get are going to come from what you put in your mouth. You know, and uh, the twenty percent of those are going to come from from exercise, yeah. from actually doing something. Yeah. You know, carrying extra weight makes you injury prone. It also, you know, can create depression. It can create, you know, body dysmorphia. It can create a lot of things. So, this idea that food is so closely attached to emotion, which is so closely attached to the effort that you put into everything, almost everything comes down to this. You know, and then there's the, the scientific side of healthier food and proper balance. It reduces the inflammation. It helps you recover better. Um, If you look at some of the big bodybuilders and power lifters or high, high level athletes, even endurance athletes, the majority of what they do, um, the success that they have is from the foods that they cycle within their training programs Mm -hmm. on days that they're doing this, they're eating this on days that they're doing that, they're eating that. So that's a huge component of success and failure. Um, and when you're particular about one thing, you tend to be particular about everything, you know, it sort of clicks when you, when you're, when you're in a, in a mode of a diet, whether it's a ketogenic diet, whether it's a, um, you know, lower carb or carb cycle is that you feel this connection to something and then it starts to become part of who you are. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it's the old adage of like, you know, how do you know if somebody has an iPhone? This is one they you know, yeah, just yeah. wait, they'll tell you. Wait 30 they'll seconds. They'll tell they'll, you, right? They'll show you, yeah. right? And you, you feel that sense of pride when you're on a diet and you have those extra weight come off. And now those people become advocates for those things. And then it just starts to snowball from there. So the diet is so much more than just um, the food that you're putting in. The chain reaction that it causes emotionally is what really sets people in the right direction, I feel. Yeah, it, it really is a chain reaction. And it's interesting that it, it's a one-way chain reaction because – We've experienced it and we see it all the time. Like people can be super disciplined and super hardcore about their workouts. Yeah. But there's something about it. There's like, instead of a chain reaction, it's like a boomerang where it's like, oh man, we just had this killer workout. Let's go, you know, have some beers. Yeah. Right. But if you go the other way, it's like, all right, I'm going to cut out alcohol and I'm going to cut out carbs. And then all of a sudden, like, you're more disciplined about work and working mm-hmm. out. And it's just like, man, if I'm doing all this effort to keep my diet on point, mm-hmm. like everything else is just like, it's so easy to be disciplined. Next 30 days, no beer, no alcohol for me. Really? No alcohol. Nice. No, nice. nice. I did a, uh, you know, it's so true. I did like a 30 day elimination diet a couple months ago. And it, I mean, for all the working out we, we do, like it, it worked better. It works better <laughs> than anything. Yeah, yeah. It's just like pouring some fuel in the fire, right? So uh, these eight essential tips mm-hmm. for pain-free exercise. Uh, I hope you found them helpful. Um, and here's some suggestions for you. Uh, what to do next. If you are not part of our Dragon Gym community yet, uh, give us a call or visit our website and set up an orientation with one of our instructors. 
Uh, it's free. It's free. It's no obligation. And um, we can find out if we will be a good match. Remember that idea we talked about finding the right coach? Right coach. Uh, for the results that you're looking for. Uh, we're not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we turn people away a lot. Yep. Uh, but there's only one way to find out. And that's with the conversation. One more plug for our self-defense clinic coming up on Friday, November 30th, 6.30 p.m. This is for men and women. Men and women. And this is one of those, we talked about this a minute ago where it's, you know, realizing that you should have done something when it's too late. Um, this is a big one. You know, you don't want to realize that you should have come to a self-defense clinic or done self-defense classes when you're in the heat of a moment of something. These, these things happen. They happen often. Uh, and it's imperative that you um, prepare yourself and your family members. So this is open to all of our adult students, all of our adult parents, the public, their friends, their family. Bring them in. We have an enormous space, so we can fit a lot of people in this joint. Yeah. Um, Friday, 11, uh, 30, which is November 30th, 6.37. We'll, we're going to do some awareness stuff. We'll do some physical techniques. And then we're going to do a little bit of Q&A because this is a really hot topic for people. Yeah. Um, especially with the way things are today in the world, it's important that uh, we have an open form of communication and conversation. Self-defense is one of those things that's a uh, best to have and not need yeah. than a need and not have. What's the quote? I'd rather be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the, in the, on war, the battle. Yeah, yeah. War. yeah. yeah. Ah, if you are already part of our DG family, consider adding a martial art, adding kettlebells, barbells, or yoga, or hiring one of our personal trainers. Um, if anything of these interests you, you can contact me directly. That's something, isn't it? There you go. So, gave you a personal email? I know. Because you're always saying, like, hey, Sam, how come people are always calling me? I was like, you know what? <laughs> this time, I'll give them mine. Fine. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Hop on that one, people. All right, uh, 801. 801. Nailed. Nice job. Well done, my friend. Thank you, guys. Well done. Appreciate you listening.